So today we'll be talking about simple harmonic motion You might see that abbreviated in the textbook as SHM. And so anything that is described as harmonic motion means that whatever position you start at, you will finish at. So you are doing something like the following. And if you have some mass on a pendulum of some length L, you saw that the pendulum swung over to the blue side, and then it went back to the red side. And so going from the red over to the blue and then back to the red, we defined as one period. So we represent that with a capital T. And so the period is the time it takes to do one, you could think of it as a cycle. Or return to your starting position. And so another example of this is a mass on a spring. And so if you start off with your spring really compressed, then when you let the spring go, it'll stretch itself out. before returning to its initial compressed state. And so these are two uh, common examples. Uh, can you guys think of something else that we've done in class that starts from one position and then returns to that same position? Like, uh, so if you think about a if you released a ball in a loop like this, then the ball would start over there, then it would come over here, and then it would return back to that kind of start position. Any other examples? So yeah, so when you have orbital motion, the planet or moon or whatever is going to start in one point in space, go around the whatever it's orbiting and then return back to the same place. So that's another example of simple harmonic motion. So uniform circular motion. Is an example of something that is undergoing simple harmonic motion. So you have all these different kinds of examples. So we've got pendulums. We've got springs or mass spring systems. And then uniform included orbits. And so besides these things that are we've seen in our introductory physics class, there are um, a few other examples that I'll talk about on the next slide. So kind of the, this is extra motivation for wanting to learn about 
simple harmonic motion. So physicists are A, lazy, and B, the math to do physics can get really hard. So what we do a lot of the times is we find something that we can solve, like a simple harmonic oscillator, uh, a mass on a spring or a pendulum, and then we try to apply that to as many different situations as we can. So uh, when we think about quantum mechanics, when you have a, so you have your atom, you've got your electron. So the atom doesn't, or the electron doesn't really orbit the atom like a planet does. So that's not exactly right. Uh, and that's due to some quantum mechanics stuff that's not really a part of this class. But the motion of the electron can be modeled with a simple harmonic oscillator or simple harmonic motion. And then uh, maybe we'll see this on Friday with things like sound. So sound propagates in a wave. And we'll see later in class that the solution to this harmonic oscillator problem are sines and cosines. And when you plot those, those look like waves, right? So something that's oscillating like this, is the same kind of graph that you get when you plot the position of a pendulum or uh, the position of the mass in a mass spring system. And then the other thing is light. So light also propagates as a wave. So it's a bit different than sound, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but so anything that's propagating like a wave will obey the same kind of properties that these simple systems that we're going to talk about now are. So we take the things that we learn from simple systems and we apply them to more complex systems. And we, at the very least, can use that as a baseboard for uh, moving forward with more complex solutions to those problems. Uh, so this will be for the pendulum. And so for a pendulum, we had something that looks like this. So some mass on some length of string L. You found the time that it would take to go from the starting position to the red position and then back to the starting position. And remember, we said that that was the period. And so you measured the period and you measured the length of your pendulum. And you found that when you made your pendulum longer, You found a relationship between the period of your pendulum and the length, and it was some kind of straight line, right? So this is what we saw in lab. And so now I'll do a kind of, this is not gonna be a completely accurate derivation and 
I'll show you why afterwards, but this will give you a sense of how we get uh, this kind of T squared and L relationship. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is draw a free body diagram for this pendulum. And so we've got a tension force that's gonna point up the string. And then what other kind of force is gonna be acting on this mass? Yep, yep, gravity. So gravity is always acting on things that are on the earth and that's gonna point straight down. And so you see that the tension and the gravitational force are in different directions. So we're gonna to have to break one of them into components. So we could, if we left our coordinate system like this, then we would break our tension force into components. But instead of doing that, I'm going to rotate my coordinate system so that the y direction points in the direction of the tension force, and that would make my x direction point perpendicular to that. And so now we don't break our tension force into components, we break our gravitational force into components. So the gravitational force is usually mg, and now because we've rotated our coordinate system, I'm going to guess that the correct trig function is sine. And then I'll show you the test case that we can use to prove that it is sine. So, and the angle is going to be from the vertical. So this is the angle thing. So this is my guess. And then my check is gonna be if I draw my pendulum straight down, what is the angle of the pendulum? Zero. So this angle is zero. So now the force of gravity needs to point, oh, so this is the, this would be the Y component. So now MG sine of zero. So what is the sine of zero? So does it make sense that the y component of gravity would be zero if it was in the check picture that I drew? No, right? So in the picture that I drew, tension points up and gravity points straight down. Right, so in this picture, it would just be force of gravity equals mg, not zero. So we made the wrong guess. So this, I did that on purpose so we can see what it looks like if we guess wrong. So this was, oops. So this was the wrong guess. So the other thing that we could have guessed is that the Y component goes with MG cosine theta. And then again, we check at theta equals to zero. 
And in that case, the cosine of zero is one. And so you just get mg. Which is what we want when the pendulum is at the middle point. Okay, so if this is what the y component is, then what is the x component? Yeah, it'll go with sine. Okay, so now we have that the that this was our pendulum. We know the tension is pointing this way. We know that there's some x component of gravity that is mg sine theta. And there's some y component of gravity that's mg cosine theta. So now if we look at our Newton second loss equations, some of the forces in the X equals MAX, and the sum of the forces in the Y equals MAY. And remember, this is our Y direction, and this is our X direction. So let's look at the y direction first. So is this mass m, which is the ball on the string, is it accelerating in the y direction? So does the ball move in the y direction at all? No. So there, if it doesn't move in the y direction, then there can't be any acceleration in the y direction. Draw the vector hat something. And so what this means is that the, we add the tension force and the y component of the gravitational force, we have to get zero. And so when we look at the we add in the directions, then the y component of gravity becomes zero because it's pointing down. And you get that the tension force equals the y component of gravity, which was mg cosine theta. So if you were given the angle that this pendulum was at, then you could calculate the amount of the tension force using this equation. Okay. But for the most part, the y direction is not interesting because this is not the direction of motion. So instead, if we look at the x direction, so is this thing moving in the x direction? Yeah, so the acceleration is not, so it could be zero if it was moving at a constant velocity, but it's not. So the acceleration doesn't go away. And the only force acting in the X direction is the X component of gravity. And we said that was mg sine theta. So you'll see that there's an M on both sides that we can cancel. And so if we solve, so now we've solved for the acceleration of this ball or this pendulum. And so on the next slide, I'll show a simplification that we can make for this problem and for any problem that deals with angles like this. So I guess one other thing to note. So in the lab manual, it 
it talked about a restoring force. And so that what they're talking about there is the force that will make the pendulum go back to whatever position it started at. So in this case, the restoring force is the gravitational force. If you were doing a mass spring system, then the restoring force would be the um, Hooke's law force or the spring force. So restoring force is the force that makes the system return to its initial state. So now we have the acceleration that's making this thing move is G sine theta. And now a trick that we use in physics and mathematics a lot is called the small angle approximation. And the punchline is that you can make something that sine of theta approximately be equal to just theta. And when we say small angle, we're typically talking about maybe less than 15 or 20 degrees. So the main takeaway from this slide is that we're going to use the small angle approximation to say that our acceleration is just G times theta. So we've got our pendulum. We've determined that the acceleration that's causing the motion is G theta. And so if we look at the path that this pendulum would travel, It's not straight, right? It's curved. And if the pendulum went all the way around, it would make a circle. So if we remember from earlier in the semester when we talked about circular motion, we had angle, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. So do you guys remember how to convert this linear acceleration that we've just found to an angular acceleration? So the formula that we're going to use is that angular acceleration equals linear acceleration divided by the radius of the circle. So this is radius of circle. So if we wanted to convert this g times theta into an alpha, what radius of what is the radius of the circle that this thing would the path that this thing would take? Yeah. So there's only one thing that we haven't really used yet, and that's the length. So alpha equals 
A over L, which would be G theta over L. Okay. So then we also remember that we had our different kinematic equations for angular motion. And so we have these three equations. And remember, we're trying to get back to this relationship that the t squared versus L graph gave us a straight line. So we need something that has time. And now we have something that has length from our angular acceleration. So we need to pick one of these equations that has time in it. And for the first equation, we don't know, the first and second, we don't know omega final. And so we're gonna pick this third equation since we have, or We'll see what we do with the theta. Our initial angular velocity is zero if we just let the pendulum go from rest. And then we've just found an equation for alpha. And so we'll see that we have everything we need to solve this for the time, which will get us our period. Okay. So on the next slide, we'll use this equation that I've starred. So theta equals omega initial t plus one half alpha t squared. And we said that omega initial was zero. So that term is going to go away. Alpha was g theta over l t squared. And so we want to solve for the time. So let's isolate that by moving everything else to the other side. So you'll see that we get a theta over theta term. And so those thetas will cancel. And if you took the square root of both sides, you would get that T is square root of two L over G. Uh, this is almost correct. And what we actually wanted was that the period equals two pi square root G over L. Uh, and this is, this is only almost correct because I didn't use calculus to derive this. And so it's not gonna be exactly correct, but it's good enough to just get that this relationship between uh, T squared and L is linear. And so the actual derivation involves calculus and you have to solve a differential equation. And so that can be a bit complicated, but we can get pretty close to the right answer with just using the physics that we've learned in class so far.
And so all of this was to get the, the period of this pendulum. And if instead we had solved that differential equation, like I was talking about, we could get a formula for the angle of the pendulum at some time. And that would equal the amplitude of the oscillation times sine of omega t. So this is the solution to differential equation. So you don't need to know how to get this equation, but in next class, we'll talk about uh, how we use this equation. But so, Uh, just to define a couple of terms really quick. So amplitude in the pendulum case was how far back you pulled the pendulum before you started swinging it. And you saw that the amplitude didn't affect the period at all. Um, and so that was an important result to get from the lab. And now this angular frequency term is going to be related to the regular frequency term. So regular frequency, so this is frequency is one over the period. And angular frequency is just two pi times the regular frequency. Or in other words, the angular frequency is two pi over the period. And so from the lab yesterday, the period is two pi square g over L. So if we plugged that into our equation for theta, we would get a sine square root L over G times time. Oh, and this is time. And so, like I said, this is, if you plotted a sine graph, you would just get something that looks like this. And so we'll talk about the, what the amplitude and the angular frequency mean for these graphs that we'll be making. And then, like I said, anything that has a graph that looks like this is a wave. And so the properties that we're learning about for simple harmonic motion are gonna to apply to those things that act like waves. 